Arrest is dead. Well, just let's get this out of the way. It's not completely dead, but uh, it's still there, alive and kicking. But we had two years of uh, a journey that we're going to talk uh, about of moving and using rest and the lessons we've learned. And in the end, we hopefully have a surprise that you can also use. Uh, a little bit about us. Since we're talking about REST, so I decided to do it in a REST format. Uh, it's not a real API, but uh, maybe we can make one. My name is Ifim. I'm a chief architect of Live Person, and with me is Itai, that who is a system architect. And you, or you're obviously welcome to write to our emails, and we're going to be around here for questions later if you want. Uh, before, who knows? What is li what life person does and uh, what it? Okay, so I'll spend two minutes. Since we're geeks, the best way to explain is in numbers. Obviously, uh, <clears throat> we process about 200 billion requests a month. Those are API requests. We don't have website. We're talking about an API service, enterprise grade. A life person in general provides uh, digital engagements of monitoring based on self-learning algorithms and a lot of enterprise uh, blah blah, as they say. Uh, I'm not going to go into that because it's very hard to do but very boring to explain. Uh, we monitor approximately 3 billion uh, visits per month, uh, both mobile and uh, websites, uh, including mobile native using our SDKs. Uh, at any given point, we're monitoring approximately 1.4 million concurrent visits, 1 million events per second on our data buses, 1,000 uh, physical servers, a bit more than 4,000 uh, virtual machines, 6 geo distributed uh, data centers, and I think we're currently 1,200 people with uh, about 150 developers. Uh, that's about it. Um, the journey, how did we get there? Uh, Life person was written as a monolithic server with few REST APIs. And uh, when I talk to kind of young developers, I have to tell them, surprisingly, it worked. It really worked for years. And only when the company grew, when the problem space became much bigger, when we wanted to make agile changes on a, this huge monster, we understood that we're stuck. And the last kind of the last drop that killed that for us was the scale, the scalability. We uh, you, we didn't want to buy supercomputers, so we decided that uh, we have a problem. Now, being an enterprise service, we cannot just throw it out and develop it from scratch. It pays our salary, and it still pays our salary even today with the help of uh, moving to microservices. So we thought long and hard, and two years ago the company made a decision to move from monolithic and start doing the transition. Uh, the biggest problem for us actually was not so much the technology, because the technology was exciting and challenging and hard and brainstorming next to a blank wall and arguing with each other. However, the biggest problem was the culture. The biggest challenge was moving developers culturally from thinking, yeah, I'll just connect those two classes and it's going to work, to actually think in microservices. However, what we did, we started chopping. The approach we took was to take a huge legacy server code base and start chopping bit by bit and moving it away. And we ended up kind of with a much, much smaller legacy server with a lot of microservices, I think today we're running around 30, 40 microservices. All of them are wrapped with APIs. All of them have REST APIs. All of them are fun. Everything is a microservice. It's really everything it's good for. And every article you read about microservices, it's uh, decoupled. It's flexible. You can mash. You can solve surprising problems that you were uh, product problems that you were not planning to solve but you just suddenly have an epiphany, oh, if I mash those five APIs, I solve a completely different problem that we haven't thought about. The rate of change really improved. The teams got focused. They're focusing on their service. 
you do need somebody that will synchronize them all. That's why we kind of still have a job. Uh, otherwise, our, our job would have been finished about a year ago when we really finalized the design. Um, <clears throat> it's really, really easy. It's became easier to sunset. However, as, as there is a saying, every new solution solves problems, but also create new ones. Uh, nothing is perfect. I think that's why we all get paid rel relatively well, I hope. Uh, because uh, we still have a job, there are always a problem. You solve some, you get new ones. And I'm not going to talk about all the problems that we encountered with uh, microservices. It's probably like another topic for presentation. I'm going to concentrate more on the client side of problems and using REST from uh, those tiers. So first thing was relatively obvious. Great, we got those microservices, the teams of five, six people are developing microservices, great. You want to write a web app or a mobile app, uh, you have lots of APIs to deal with. So the client starts becoming very complicated because the server answer is like, okay, here is an API, enjoy it. Is it common to the neighboring API? Uh, well, we hope so. Does it speak exactly the same language? We hope so. This is kind of guidelines, and this can be taken care of. Uh, you want to synchronize them. You have to synchronize requests between them. If you want to do something, one thing, you have to call 17 APIs and then mash the results and compose them, and only then you can show something to the user. I want to go and uh, approach a search API to get the chats. The search API actually outputs chat IDs. Then you have to go to a chat API or a history API and fetch those IDs. And within those chats, you get more stuff that you need to go, and it becomes relatively complicated and full of bugs, especially for something, some simple problems. And you also get to a point where the server, like the API guys say, yeah, my API works great, leave me alone. The client guys say, I can't work with those APIs. It's very hard. Why don't they work more? Uh, <clears throat> and in addition, there is performance issue. Browsers, uh, both mobile and desktop, are limited to the number of uh, connections they can open simultaneously to the same domain. They, they got a lot better at it, but it's still problematic. If you looked at originally at our network tab on our applications, it would just be requests after requests after requests. And suddenly the client becomes this kind of synchronization point of a lot of dealing with errors and dealing with everything. And it became a problem for us. And REST kind of started already showing little cracks here. But then mobile came. Mobile in our problem space, uh, exactly also like it does said, there is a bandwidth problem. You d REST is not efficient. I want to transfer two bytes, I have to make a REST request, which is at least 1K. I want to have a polling API for chat. That consumes battery life twice in the, uh, than it would consume over a socket API. Twice. So to have a chat, you would lose, for five minutes of chat, you would lose 10% of battery, which is really, really annoying for repeating API. Uh, Two-way communications. REST does not really support that. You, it's a request response paradigm for mobile and actually in uh, modern browsers, more and more we want to be reactive, we want to react to events, we want to react to things that happened, but REST does not provide that to us. Uh, the biggest problem for us actually is legacy APIs. We have uh, 17, 15 years of history we have tons of APIs. Nobody is going to make them uh, socket-based APIs. They rest. That's it. It's like full stop. Nobody even knows how they uh, were written. They just know that they work. And when something goes wrong, we kind of find a developer that likes to squash bugs and uh, just give him a target. And he magically finds what's wrong with it. And we don't ask too many questions on the solution. Uh, that was actually one of the drivers for the solution that we came up with. Um, I really can't stress enough because when we talk to young developers or startups, 
For them, everything is new. Just don't do REST. Do a socket-based API, WebSocket, or something like that, and have a great life. All right. Uh, 15 years of history, millions of dollars of revenue, uh, tens of thousands of customers, uh, a thousand people getting salary based on those APIs, and you want to provide the best performance, but retrofitting those APIs is just not cost effective. You have plans that in a year you will replace them, you have, but for that year you want to have the best experience that you give to the visitors. Uh, we came to the solution uh, in a kind of, in the journey that I'm describing, we were very excited with microservices. We really started seeing the benefits, and then it hit us. Okay, and now we basically pushed the problem to another set of people in the company, the client guys. Uh, how do we help them? It can't be, we want to have, it can't be that hard. So we kind of had a, an interesting couple of discussions, and we came up with the solution that I'll let Itai present, and uh, have fun. Okay, so the next part is the actual solution to the problem, as Afim described it um, very accurately. We have a problem of multiple APIs when we want to aggregate data from different parts of the application, which is now microservices to the extreme. We have about 17 to 30 different microservices. So the first thing we did is we said, we want the clients to be able to get the solution in one place to different services. So we said proxy, it makes sense, right? You can build a proxy that aggregates all the data for you from the different APIs, and then you get one response back to the clients, and it makes it a lot easier. Now there are a couple of ways to do that, and the first way that most people aim for immediately is saying, okay, We'll have a proxy, and that proxy will have an understanding of the APIs, and it'll build whatever you need, and you just have a different API for it. But that means that if you have microservice, you have to maintain now the proxy for every new API. You have to enhance it. You have to build new methods, and you have to maintain the actual microservices. So we thought that doesn't make sense. We want to make it something that's more generic. So we decided we want to build a batching endpoint. What does that mean? We decided that upon convention, you can pass in a series of requests in a JSON format, and we'll execute all those requests for you and give you back one response to the client. And in that way, if you have five microservices that you will need an answer from, you can send one JSON, and you get one response for all of them instead of having to disperse all the different requests. Here comes the bachelor, which is our main core for this solution. And the bachelor, there is some things that you need to note about it if you're going to make requests. One thing is requests to different APIs have different SLAs. So for example, if I'm using a real-time API and I have a couple of services that are also using real-time APIs, batching those requests together makes sense because I'm waiting for the slowest response to be the one that brings everything back up. So you have to think about the different SLAs. The second thing about it, um, from a technological standpoint, we chose Node. And Node makes sense here because Node is very lightweight, it's asynchronous by nature, and it sort of matches the problem space that we're aiming for. It's also very robust in terms of um, performance if we're pushing a lot of requests to it. Okay, so this is the first part. The second part of this is we needed a WebSocket endpoint. We said we want our mobile strategy to be the same as our desktop strategy. So on top of the batching process, we have an endpoint that accepts a socket. And that socket accepts the same convention of JSON as does the batching endpoint, which means that now we can open a socket and push the requests and get them back. So this doesn't really solve everything, right? Because still, I'm still pushing a lot of payloads from the client back to the server to get responses. So we enhanced it a bit. So we have something called repeaters, which means that you can specify in a request that you want it to keep repeating until you get a different data response or a different um, status code from the server, and only then push it back to the client. So in that way, you sort of mimic what would be um, an event-driven system, right? You send something that's supposed to be a repeating request, a polling request, and you only get information when new information actually arrives. Another thing here that I wrote, and it's sort of grayed out on purpose because it's not built into the application, but it's more on the actual endpoint, is on close requests. If you have a WebSocket and that WebSocket disconnects while you're running in the application, it makes sense to notify the application that your user has disconnected. So 
that's something that you can support on the actual WebSocket tier. And I'll, I'll get to that a bit later, but I just wanted to mention it here. So we have the persistent adapter, which is the one that makes the repeating requests, which talks to the bachelor, which is the one that actually does the batching requests. It's the same solution. And again, we're talking to the same level of APIs, and you still have to consider your SLAs here when you're passing in requests. So what's the actual architecture that we went for? We went for an Nginx web tier with REST web endpoint and a WebSocket endpoint. And they talk to the persistent adapter and the bachelor core, as I've reviewed before. So the results. Well, in terms of performance, we still have, don't have the final numbers because it's something that, um, that's being worked on. It's working in production, but we haven't collected enough data for me to come up here and say, listen, this is, this is it. But we will publish it. And for, in terms of the core itself, we know we have no memory leaks. It's tested. We have CI processes running, making sure continuous integration processes, making sure that it's uh, running perfectly. All it needs in terms of the server and the virtual machine is 100 megabytes in order to run on the core. And we use it in production, which means that our systems are already testing it every day, every time we have users using it. And now we're open sourcing it. So this is gonna be available, or actually is available on GitHub right now for you to check out. Um, this is a work that's, thank you. This is a work that's gonna be continuing, uh, continuously developed because we're still working on it, we're still adding features to it, and we want your contributions. If anybody wants to make contributions, feel free. So what's the future for it? I mean, we, we have something that answers part of our problem space, but still there are more problems, right? So I have a lot of APIs, and sometimes you get something that's called dependencies. API A makes a request. There's a response in API B, which I need the data from to continue the request. So the first part of our roadmap is to build a dependency adapter, meaning I can specify by convention that when response A returns, it gets baked into request B. And then after all the requests have executed, you get back all your data. Second part is composition. A lot of times the clients get all the information back, so you pulled five different APIs. And now you have to build something that the client can deal with and can use in the application. So you have a lot of remodeling in your application. It's taking the JSON, it's building new objects, it's creating things that you can use. So the second part is a composition adapter. We're gonna write something that says, by convention, you can pass in the format of the responses you want and how we bake those requests into a single response where your client can already use which means you define it once and you don't have to write the code multiple times. The last part is NPM packaging, which will be coming soon. And the next part is we're gonna open source client libraries in order to enable to use this easier the way that we use it today. That's on our roadmap, which is for batching from desktops, obviously, and for the WebSocket to HTTP client. And we have other sort of client libraries that we're gonna do in yeah, mobile native, and we have all other <laughs> interesting ideas in this direction. Uh, thank you. Uh, just to add something, uh, to stress another point, we, uh, just to give you an example, when we found this problem, we went to GitHub and searched for something, and uh, we found a library which looked like uh, saving, Savior. Uh, I'm not gonna obviously mention the name, but uh, it was all great, it looked amazing on paper, until we started running performance tests. Uh, for making 100,000 requests, it was consuming one gig of RAM and continuing leaking memory. So uh, just know that we have stress tested this a lot in various environments. And another addition is uh, we have already feedback from developers, both desktop client and mobile native. Uh, and some of our native uh, products, apps, would not be possible without this solution. It's really, really helping them. Uh, an extra benefit of it is that the internal convention is very, very, very REST-like. Uh, you, you can work with it as if you're doing REST with a very, very simple translation layer. That means that all the documentation you have written over the years over the REST API still applies. You give the developer a REST API and a half a page document how to use that over Bachelor, and uh, it works. It works great, it works in our mobile apps, it works in our client uh, web apps. Uh, it's, it's a real world solution. Thank you. Uh, questions? questions? Yeah. You've uh, mentioned performance. I'm wondering uh, how, how big is that performance? 
So this, the performance is uh, two parts that you get. You get the performance improvements on bandwidth, especially for repeating APIs. It doesn't really make sense using Bachelor if you do one request to a REST API and come back. It only makes sense to do it if you have to repeat this call every few seconds. Uh, yes, you can construct a test where the request is just fits into a frame of TCP AP and the response just that and the performance improvement will not be there. But for WebSocket part, if it's a regular API, we see up to 10 times improvement in bandwidth. Uh, for the reason that in a chat protocol, you don't keep asking the full TCP request, the full REST request saying, do you have any lines for me? Do you have any lines for me? You just get an improvement. Uh, CPU-wise, again, because it's less information to process on the client, uh, you, it's just less unmarshalling and marshalling both ways. How many, uh, how many uh, requests per second do you from a single server? So this is coming. I don't want to really give because this is currently, it's uh, the preliminary numbers uh, for single core simple virtual machine. We use everything virtualized, running OS, and one thread of Node.js. It's above 1,000 concurrent, but it really depends. Again, there is the, if we're talking about proxy, which Bachelor is, there is the law on a proxy. Your performance depends actually not on you. It's on the end APIs. If the API responds in 10 milliseconds, that's it's great. As soon as it goes to 20, you just lost half of your uh, capacity. So you have to over-provision, and this is already something we started talking to production, using completely different rules. You don't over-provision like we usually do at like 60% capacity, that's our red line. For proxy like this, it's a lot lower, but the machines are a lot cheaper. Uh, in addition, it's all in one data center, for us at least, so you get the local communication. Uh, Again, future-wise, some of the problems we see, we don't know yet, but uh, if we continue and we develop new, new APIs over WebSockets purely, uh, will a mobile app be able to handle 10 WebSocket connections, or does Bachelor kind of can batch WebSocket connections as well for us? We, this is also under investigation in our lab. So performance numbers are coming, and they will be posted on GitHub. Uh, and we encourage you to ask questions there and start discussions on the GitHub repository. This is our primary repository. We, it's not a copy of something we have. We actually pull from that repository into our production. Mm -hmm. we, reposit, we open source the core. We, we have examples for wrappers, for WebSocket and Express in Node.js, for REST. Uh, but the core is we pull in and pull into our live person wrappers. We didn't want to open source all the security layers that we have. Any more questions? Yeah. Um, as, as you can see, it, um, does a, uh, like, like a consumer of this, uh, of the batch log, for example, a uh, client's uh, web browser, do you see that it actually makes requests specifying the, the services that it actually needs? Right. As opposed to, uh, I don't know, to um, exporting this on, like, uh, create uh, instead of, of creating of specifying all the all the requests to the multiple services, create create one uh, one request which knows how to do this on on the server side. So I, I wouldn't expect that the client side would know how to, uh, to specify those mm -hmm. services. I would abstract it from. But this is uh, okay. So let's. There are two answers. Bachelor today is a completely API agnostic system. It does know does not know what to do. It's basically by convention, which is very very like REST plus. Uh, it specifies to which APIs you want to go. The benefit for us in an immediate term is that we have all the documentation for our REST APIs, and it's just another half an hour with Bachelor convention, and you're done. And if Bachelor is down, your client can fall back to pure REST if that's really important for you. Uh, we've been talking about what you call recipes. Uh, we don't want to hard code those recipes in code, and we've been entertaining an idea of having dynamically managed recipes so that the client says, I want to do X. For us, it means A, B, and C today, but uh, in half a year, it might mean something else a little bit. 
that will help us also with sunsetting some APIs, replacing them and upgrading them. For now, this is, uh, this is like this. You can easily add a recipe mechanism to this and we would encourage if you want to do a pull request on GitHub. So we haven't developed the composition part. It's part of our roadmap. But what we're seeing is on the clients, once we get um, really complicated data, like on a web browser, if you have to remodel um, a data structure for lots of reporting APIs, then it's something that's very CPU consuming on the client itself. And you don't know what level of CPU they have, or how many processes they're running, or what kind of browser they're running. So optimizing on the, cust on the actual client on the browser is a lot more complicated. When we write it, we'll do, of course, performance testing and see if it makes sense, it doesn't make sense. But I don't, I don't have those numbers right now. So let me try to answer. This is uh, a little bit more also with the couch and reality of life. On a piece of paper, it works really well. However, when you take it down to people and teams, uh, there is a lot of tension between client guys and server guys. Now, the client people normally move in a lot faster manner. And they, at least in life person, we decided to, tr to treat backend back APIs as data security repositories with minimum business logic and the power goes to the client side. This way we can uh, very uh, in an agile manner develop different solutions. Otherwise what you're suggesting, yes, we could add it into some sort of API but that also runs the risk of getting back to a monolithic architecture which is a monolithic server that has business logic that internally uses APIs, and that means uh, we also have to consider. Yeah, they talk with each other, that's what they do, but you end up with a lot of dependencies where a team cannot just release a new version and it's available. That's true. It's true, but the solution to, if it's uh, helping the client guy, the solution for us is a recipe, which becomes kind of this way. Recipes have pluses and minuses. Today, Bachelor for us can be not in a critical path. We can roll it out, uh, we, we're able to roll it out, not in a critical path, saying let's use Bachelor. If it's down, let's use pure REST APIs. We had a fallback. Now when it matured and is stable enough, we will remove this fallback mechanism and will entertain the idea of recipes. However, we have to be very, very careful in coupling for us. If it means that in order to add something to an API, I have to release three or four systems, that for us means three or four teams. That's release cycles, uh, change in their priorities, roadmaps, and so on. It's also a problem space of life person and the scale of life person managing 150 developers divided into 25, 27 teams, try to run around the office and coordinate the release of eight teams for a small bug fix on one API. Now, this is impossible, so we are trying to preserve the benefit of the microservice. You as a team, that's your problem space, release, that's it. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you very much.